Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Tackling Security Through the Supply Chain webinar hosted by the UEFI Forum. We will get started in just a few moments here. Thank you for joining the Tackling Security Through the Supply Chain webinar as part of, part of the UEFI 2022 Virtual Summit. I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speakers this morning. We're joined by Tim Lewis, CTO, Inside Software, and Alex Matrusev, CEO, Binarly. And from there, I'll pass it off to the presenters. Hey, good morning. My name is Tim Lewis, I'm CTO of Firmware. Uh, CTO of uh, Inside Software, as you just heard. And today we want to talk about an important topic of firmware supply chain and how it affects firmware security. We're going to take some case studies and look at how supply chain failures have led to security failures in the firmware ecosystem. We're going to talk about different steps that you can take to bridge the gaps in the supply chain, and then we'll, then we'll do some next steps. Earlier this year, the US Department of Commerce and Homeland Security issued a statement talking about firmware security. They said, quote, firmware presents a large and ever expanding attack surface as the population of ele electronic devices grows. Securing the firmware layer is often overlooked, but it, it is a single point of failure in devices and is one of the stealthiest methods in which an attacker can compromise devices at scale. Over the past few years, hackers have increasingly targeted firmware to launch devastating attacks. This is true not only, uh, this is certainly true within the UEFI firmware ecosystem. That's what we want to talk about today. Now, there are two large questions we want to look at, which is how at each stage of the firmware supply chain does each stage know that what they have received has not been tampered with? And secondly, how does each stage know if a security disclosure applies to what they've received? So if you read the read a news, you read an email, you get a security bulletin, how do you know if your firmware is involved? And as you can see in the diagram on the right, there are several different stages that firmware goes through from the time it, uh, it's originally written till the time it reaches the end user. In this process, the OEMs and ODMs have an essential part because they are the ones who create the production firmware binaries and distribute them. They, they are the last ones to see all of the different firmware ingredients before they're actually put down on the motherboard. And when a security fix comes along, they're the ones who usually have to make sure that that security fix gets integrated, that it's put down and, and tested on the particular hardware that they ship, and then they distribute it to their to the users or the, to their customers. And if that process breaks down, it can cause a lot of problems. Each of the places that are black arrows on this diagram are places where something can go wrong. Something, someone, it could get halted, it could get stopped, it could inter, interjection from a, a malware actor. So we wanna make sure that each step we make it secure. How does security get to the end user today? Well, production firmware consists of many ingredient provider, providers through several different stages. Starting at the left side of this diagram, you see, can see open source pieces, third-party software, and silicon vendors. Then that's usually taken in by a BIOS vendor who it themselves have several teams that are going to work on the, on the, the code, handing off from the kernel team, the chipset team, the OEM feature team, which carry, helps OEMs carry features from generation to generation of their products, and the OEM team that helps the OEM put it on the, on the motherboard. Then it goes to the ODM. The ODM may do some modifications of their own, they often do, to make manufacturing easier, 
the OEM is going to put their final stamp with their special features on there. The value added reseller who themselves may use binary tools that are provided by the bias vendor to make changes and prepare it for their particular market that they're selling to. The IT department that's going to prepare the system for deployment within the enterprise and all the software that they use. And finally, it reaches the end user. Firmer ingredients are received from the previous stage, possibly modified and combined, and then passed to the next stage. Which reads, reaches its final and most critical role, which is the role of the IT and end users, because these are the people who are responsible for updating the firmware. If a security vulnerability happens, it is the IT department or the end user who is going to be responsible for deploying that updated firmware onto their platform. Unfortunately, the end users are often the least likely to read published security reports and have the least visibility into firmware ingredients. So we have to rely on their, the communication that it's, we have with these folks to actually deploy the security fixes. So you see that have this long supply chain that leads to this critical point where the, of the IT or end user actually deploying it so that the ecosystem can actually be secure. So look at, let's look at how this long supply chain with all these, these multiple players actually leads to an impact on the deployment of security, uh, security fixes and uh, vulnerabilities. I hand this off to Alex. Thank you, Tim, for a great explanation of complexity of the supply chain. And uh, good morning, everyone. So on this slide, actually, you can see how the complexity applies to the reality. And we have a different suppliers, different layers, which is actually introduce, can introduce the different type of vulnerabilities. And also because of this complexity and also asynchronous uh, nature of update cycles from the different vendors and different parties involved in supply chain, it can introduce different type of vulnerabilities. And someday, some, sometime end day vulnerabilities can actually stay for a very long timeline as a zero days for some of the vendors. And it's create actually a huge impact to the end customer. And also another problem when, as example, in your supply chain, different layers can introduce a different uh, exploitation primitive or triggers, which will be not actually vulnerable by itself, but if combining them to the chain, it can provide a, to the attacker the possibility to get a successful attack on the device. Finally, less than a year actually disclosed more than, um, publicly disclosed more than uh, 50 vulnerabilities. But basically right now we are uh, tackling with a problem when we've been talking about SMM privilege escalation, SMM memory corruption for years, but still such problems appears in, uh, in many, uh, different type of devices, different type of vendors, and different layers of supply chain. Also, I wanted to thank you, Intel, for a very great program, uh, bug bounty program, Project Circuit Breaker, which has actually been a very great event to connecting different researchers for uh, working together on finding the problems on provided device, targeted device, by uh, Intel team and uh, actually binarily been one of the first uh, group of people who actually committed with the widest impact and most eligible report to this program. But let's focus on failures uh, which is happening in the supply chain. And you can see on this table where we actually describe different type of supply chain failures related to the silicon vendor independent bias vendors or ODM and OEM firmware code. And um, all of this advisor is described in the, into the details on uh, binary advisory page or our blog posts. So, but I want to introduce you to from the high level perspective, perspective to each of them on this presentation. 
And let's start with Intel BSSA DFT issue, which is actually a very interesting uh, example of supply chain failure where we have a logical bug which is actually introduced by development team. And this logical bug is actually very hard to detect. On the same time, we have some capability, which is a low targeted system to load into the runtime some piece of code, which will be unsigned. And uh, um, last year on the Black Hat, we presented uh, the POC, how actually this attack can be successfully done through the exploitation of this vulnerability, but also we demonstrated complexity of uh, exploitation chain can be get done through the uh, platform initialization phase. But um, focusing on this particular issue, I wanted to say uh, it's very hard to detect with any sort of the static analysis tooling on the source code level because this code looks correct from the perspective of the source code analysis tools. And it looks incorrect because it's, it is a logical bug. I think in this case, like a test, uh, test cases uh, created onto the code and such functionality can highlight this problem, but not a static analysis tooling, unfortunately. Uh, another issue, it is, uh, inside EDE bus, uh, which is actually a very complex piece of uh, software as well. And uh, this driver actually been uh, already reintroducing the vulnerabilities during some timeline and binarily uh, team uh, discovered uh, at least three different vulnerabilities in the same driver. Problem here is complexity of the code. We have a multiple, uh, multiple uh, child SMI handlers. We have a uh, very complex COM buffer, uh, which is actually uh, introducing some new functionality probably over the time. And uh, developers sometimes can fail on introducing new boundaries. And the same problem we can see not only on uh, this uh, IBV vendor, also another good example is American Megatrans USBRT, where uh, this has been leading to some repeatable failures uh, in the timeline of the five years. Again, the problem is the complexity of piece of this software. And recently we found on newer devices, uh, same uh, class of vulnerabilities uh, introduced on the Dell devices. All this advisor has disclosed and thank you for the Dell, to the Dell team for working with us on this disclosure and make them fixed. AMD adjusts uh, reference code vulnerability. It's very interesting example when actually the variable name can be used, uh, can be named uh, different ways from the vendor who developed this piece of firmware. And uh, also it's kind of like hard to understand does this really the same vulnerability or not, but basically code similarity mechanisms and uh, uh, at scale with AMD corpus can help to understand uh, and find the similar cases where it's just the name with the difference, but everything else is the same. And of course, like uh, this vulnerability actually uh, providing some very interesting uh, code execution uh, path for the attacker when you can uh, basically override the get variable, like variable and lead to the EFI runtime services reintroduction and show code address uh, will be provided over this path to execute the code. That's very interesting issue because when we just found on HP device this problem, we've been really thinking uh, it is just applies to one vendor, but then we figure it out. It's actually scales to much more and bigger impact across uh, the industry. Uh, with AMD ecosystem and not only to the single device. And that's exactly where the complexity play uh, like uh, against uh, the defenders and don't provide enough telemetry to understand how the impact uh, in reality looks like. And uh, also the tools we're actually using for uh, detecting some problems, I mean, static analysis tools for the code, uh, source code, it's, it's 
in many cases, it's failing to find the right uh, problem or trigger because usually it's pretty straightforward. And uh, uh, if you use something advanced like SAML in the past, so it is kind of like need, need someone who understand how to develop such rules, semantic rules to detect uh, vulnerable code patterns in the source code level. But classical source code analysis tools by default can find pretty straightforward patterns only. And here on the slide, it's another HP vulnerability, which has been fixed uh, in uh, um, February, oh, sorry, March 8. And uh, uh, thank you for HP team, first of all, for uh, fixing all the vulnerabilities and collaborating on coordinated disclosure. Uh, but secondly, uh, we actually sent another vulnerability to HP, uh, which we called binarily 2021-47. But for us, it's been looks a bit different, but at the end, we realized it's the same vulnerability, why it's not get a CVE, because it's been actually fixed with uh, 2021-40. But uh, why I have two screenshots here, the timeline for different product lines being different. And if you look, the code is also looks a bit different. It's the compiled code from the binary and uh, uh, reconstructed by Hexrace decompiler. So basically, the main difference, it is use a different PCD value. But as example, if, if you will be using the source code analysis tool for finding this straightforward pattern, uh, it will be failed because PCD value are different. And uh, this is just one of the examples where uh, in reality, we have, as example, some timeline when the similar issues can appear on the different devices, even from the same vendor. Another uh, interesting, interesting case, it is actually dependency graph limitation when basically we have a uh, library code. In this case, uh, we have EDK2 piece of uh, code introduced it in security package where it's actually introducing the classical callout vulnerability, uh, which is can, be, can lead to the arbitrary code execution if it will be available in runtime, of course. We found this uh, vulnerability on Intel M15 and been working with Intel p where we realized this uh, particular code, it's not available actually in Intel M15 device in runtime. It's been compiled to the binary by some of the mistakes or like using like some old code for uh, code base from EDK, but it's not being present in runtime because it's been not loaded at the time when, as example, uh, uh, later stages of the boot when operating system boots or basically the attacker have an ability to exploit this vulnerability from EFI shell or some other directions. But interestingly, this uh, vulnerable application being called Trusted Device Setup App. Um, anyway, uh, such problem actually in this particular device is not exploitable, but it can be exploitable on some other devices. And basically the same vulnerable code pattern can be actually legit vulnerability and uh, lead to the callout code execution in a semi-handler uh, in the reality, but with a different vendor. So uh, this particular problem actually also shows some limitations of our uh, SBOM uh, concept right now, because if we have the library, but library will be looks like not vulnerable or don't have like a, a attached uh, CPEs or vulnerability description identification numbers, it will be not trigger the red flag. Basically, that will be compiled in our supply chain and can stay for years there. It's exactly what particularly can happen with this uh, vulnerability failure. And uh, the last one uh, for failures, uh, but not least for this presentation, uh, so it is a uh, compiler generated artifacts. And uh, this particular slide, it shows very interesting problem where we can have like, we uh, creating some sanitization boundaries for the com buffer. Problem here, after the code get compiled, compiler thinks differently than a developer and use not a dynamic size uh, 
validation, it just use particular uh, size of the buffer, which is actually make uh, these boundaries and sanitization uh, weaker and can potentially lead to vulnerability, exploitable vulnerability and uh, create some problems which will be which is not visible on the source code level because this exactly uh, goes after the compiler and it shows why we need to pay much more attention to the binary analysis and look what exactly we are shipping to the customers and not only analyze the source code thanks Tim? alex yep thanks yeah. alex so you can see that there's a number of different uh, problems that happen because of the different hands which handled all of the different code along the way. It makes uh, both understanding the where the issue first started, whether it was in some pre-compiled library or binary, and also um, what how it got handed from person to person and the changes were introduced. So you want to know, if you want to bridge the supply chain securely, you want to know what in firmware ingredients does each product have? That's an important list because then you will be able to find out if these ingredients are then correlated to some uh, disclosure, some CVE, uh, which because you want to know which firmware ingredients have a known vulnerability. Have the firmware ingredients been tampered with? That is, has someone modified them um, along the way that you didn't realize you thought you were receiving X and you actually were, were receiving Y? And finally, do users know how to update their product? That's a big challenge for OEMs and, and ODMs. There are a lot of tools that are available for firmware security. Um, and this slide just lists them in summary all the way from uh, you know, dealing with the supply chain, knowing that, about the pedigree and tamper status of source code and pre-built binaries that you've received. We have uh, tools to deal with those all the way through intervention at the end when a, uh, this, a vulnerability has been exploited, how does the IT department work to uh, mitigate those, those problems? But we're going to talk about three here, the supply chain, binary, the static analysis of binaries, and security testing from tools that, can, that are done at runtime. One of the new tools that are, that's become extremely uh, interesting recently has been our SPDX SBOMs. Now, SPDX SBOMs are one type of SBOM. There's another, there are others, but they, this focuses on the transmission of source ingredients before creating the production firmware binaries. The SPDX SBOMs help OEMs and ODMs to track the origin and licenses of ingredient source code and binaries, to identify whether the ingredients have been modified stage to stage, and to know if product contains ingredients which were with reported known vulnerabilities. And this is important, especially for things like libraries, because many times libraries are used in a pre-compiled form. Um, their, their libraries are included into a final driver, a, a PEIM or a Dixie driver, SMM driver, and you don't ever, they never really, uh, you don't really know necessarily by looking at the binary that the, uh, it contains a library that might have a vulnerability. So SPDXs help us to track that information across uh, the product as it goes through its lifeline. So currently, Tiano Core tags all files with SPDX license identifier to help by uh, automation. This allows uh, tools uh, and tool chains to flow through, gather, have all the information that they need in order to create SPDX files for a given uh, source drop. And also, there are red tools readily available, open source tools for managing SPDX files, creating them. I, I list the ones for Python here, but there are ones for Java and, and other uh, programming languages as well to be able to create uh, SPDX files from your source trees and uh, generate a file that you can then use and verify use to verify that nothing's changed. Another type of SBOM that's increasingly generated interest in the industry are uh, SWID SBOMs or SWID SBOMs, and these really are used and they're focused on the identity of production firmware binaries. Uh, SWID SBOMs help IT and end users to inventory firmware on the platform, uh, whether executables and blobs, and also to check for security disclosures reported that affect that firmware. That is, you can match CVEs, you potentially could match CVEs against the, the hashes or the identity of those, uh, th those drivers or executables and see whether you've got, you're affected or not. So UEFI firmware currently 
can retrieve attached firmware information using DMTF's SBDM uh, protocol. That is, you can go ask other uh, about other firmware on the device. You can also validate the firmware measurements against golden values. That is, to, if you know what the value should be and you see that it's changed, you can uh, use that as a root of trust sort of uh, measurement. And you can also record the measurements and the identifiers in the TCG event log. In fact, there was a great presentation given on a virtual uh, UEFI seminar back in December called Traceable Firmware Bill of Materials Overview that talks about this exact topic. And since that time, uh, the LV, LF, LVFS project and this project called Python USWID have come out with uh, tools attempting to see how we might integrate this process into uh, UEFI firmware as a way of integrating these kind of SBOMs directly into the binary image. We also have some further security tools. Um, of course, we've mentioned Intel's ChipSec has been around for a while. Uh, it's an open source thing, uh, project that checks uh, can check both uh, chipset registers, but also registers from other industry standards like TCG to check the running configuration for vulnerable settings. In addition, you know, other open source tools are Binary's EFI Explorer, uh, which a lot help, helps break down uh, UEFI binaries into their component pieces and lets you analyze them. It helps the analysis of them to find out what's really there. And then Binary's FW Hunt, which is a tool which applies rules to a given binary to see if many of the known vulnerabilities that have been reported recently are actually present in that binary. The, the rules uh, uh, are do well documented. You can also, you could create your own rules as well, but they help check bias binaries for known bad code patterns. Now let Alex talk about a couple of these, these tools, which are quite interesting. Thank you, Tim. Yes, and uh, looking on the binary code, it's very important, as I mentioned before, uh, on vulnerability uh, slides. And uh, also, we created EFI Explorer uh, exactly by the reason we didn't find any good solution for verifying the binary, uh, researching the binaries. Uh, and actually, this is a plugin for IDA Pro. And as example, like easily you can look what kind of uh, NVRAM variables is actually introduced on the full firmware image, not just a single UEFI um, driver. Uh, basically, uh, you can load to the IDA Pro the full firmware image and see a lot of details and build the dependencies. And also we have some uh, generic vulnerability detection things related to the callouts and get variable misuse, which is very helpful and uh, helping actually to fix the supply chain to find these repeatable failures and actually uh, don't repeat such of uh, similar vulnerability patterns again and again. So uh, regarding the firmware hunt, uh, this approach been developed because we don't see the right solution for finding uh, the vulnerability patterns. And actually, if you're using as example, the solutions like Yara, which has been creating more for detecting like malicious triggers or some artifacts, IOCs for uh, malicious code, it's not very suitable when you have a uh, vulnerability trigger in multiple uh, different functions or multiple uh, pieces of the code, which is not really uh, combined in few basic blocks uh, from near each other. So basically it will be cause like very opaque way for generating the Yara rule for the detection, which is hard to debug, hard to understand, and actually leads to a lot of false positives. Uh, our way it's actually use the semantic annotations for, for the code to create more feasible way to detect uh, such of the problems. As example, one of these rules, it is actually USB RT issue, which has been mentioned before and recently disclosed it with the Dell teams. And uh, uh, all our uh, uh, disclosures lead uh, for firmware hunt tools and it's provided for free, just help the industry and fix the supply chain and actually scale the detection with our community scanner. This is another example, which was recently uh, released. It's related to ESET uh, uh, found very interesting uh, way of implementing the Dixie driver and this driver being called Secure Vector. Uh, I like the name, special kudos for this. And um, also, we um, start thinking how we can improve the firmware hunt and new upcoming release 
will be introduced the variance when basically you can find not only one vulnerability, you can find the different variants of the same vulnerability with a single role, which will be make much more powerful and much more useful the tool and it already is. So this works very fast on the whole firmware image and detect, uh, as example, like 10 rules get uh, triggered on this particular uh, firmware image. Right. So there's been a lot of stuff here, but it's important for OEMs and ODMs uh, that you start to take steps now to find the ingredients that make up your firmware and keep track of them, to be aware of what's in them so that you can handle uh, security disclosures that are coming down. Um, sometimes it, if the faster that the OEMs and ODMs can respond, the faster that these issues can be fixed uh, all the way down to the end user. For IT and end users, it's also important to find out how you can be notified about vulnerabilities in your firmware and its ingredients. Even if you have the, even if you had the full source code, um, you, even if you, or you don't, you need to know what is the way that I'm going to find out about these disclosures. Make sure you check out, um, you know, some, some computers have a, a little app that pops up if there's a new UEFI firm, a firmware update. Sometimes there's, you need to read the notifications and the emails. But at any stage of the supply chain, use the tools to simplify vulnerability tracking on your platforms. This is a big area that I think that you're seeing a lot of investment. Uh, and over the next, uh, over the next six months to a year, Two years, you'll probably see a lot of improvements in this area. But right now, it's important that you start thinking about what's in your platform, what ingredients in your platform, and how do you know if they are the ones that have vulnerabilities? Thank you. And now we're up there for questions. So our first question is, are all of the OEM security vulnerabilities disclosed specific to just that OEM or are other OEMs also affected? I think the ones that we talked about in this one were, um, they were just that OEM. They weren't, they weren't applicable. Some of them were applicable across the board, but some of the, most of them were just to that OEM, right, Alex? Yeah, I think like a, a silicon vendor issues when it comes down to the reference code, it's actually can, uh, can be a affect uh, the whole product lines on, based on this uh, particular reference code base. And sometimes even worse, uh, and it can affect multiple uh, generation of uh, firmware because it's some some sort of like a baseline code which is broadly used. And um, yeah, I think uh, we covered some of the examples with the silicon vendors and dependent bias developers, which is actually can 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 affect not a single vendor; it can affect multiple vendor with the same vulnerability. But it really depends. Sometimes even like. Uh, IBV code or reference code can be changed and make an issue not exploitable or not use this particular feature because it's yet removed by the vendor. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Our next question is, do you feel enabling the secure boot feature in pre-boot will help users avoid these security attacks? No. I think, all of the, no. Yeah. I think the ones that all the ones we talked about today are ways that could be used to bypass uh, secure boot projections. Um, secure boot, it is a runtime uh, feature, and basically it transitions the trust uh, through early stages of the boot to operating system. But basically, if that hacker will be exploiting the issue uh, from the operating system in some of the UEFI component, it's already get verified. And this runtime exploitation, it's very hard to detect. And uh, in many cases, it's just uh, no good solution for such detections existing right now. Yeah. All right, thank you. Our next question is, wouldn't it increase security if end users could simply integrate fixes themselves, having the source code available, available and auditable? Yeah, that's one way to solve the problem. However, I would say that so fixing some of these issues is, is actually can take, um, uh, the patching process is not easy, even between platforms on the same chipset. So it's, it, it takes, uh, and then being able to test, test the process that makes sure that your fix is okay. I would say that patching has proved a problem even for, for our customers. Uh, so yeah, sure, you could, do, you could do it. That is one answer, but I don't think that it's gonna help my grandma uh, fix her, her platform. Uh, exactly. Because, 
we can we can see in the wild when uh, some of the vulnerabilities uh, known vulnerabilities it's actually stay unpatched for years and uh, that's a create a problem of like also like some of the products like uh, let's say uh, uh, system board it's get out of the support cycle and the vendor not supporting an updates for this particular board but it's still getting used in some cases so i think this exactly shows the complexity of the supply chain and it's exactly the problems which we've been talking through the, our presentation with team i think sbom also can help to partially solve these problems and actually uh, reduce the timeline for release the fixes, but fixes the delivery to endpoints, it's a completely different problem. Yeah, we've All right. yeah. Our Go next ahead. question is, is there a centralized SBOM database where we can look up to see if the specific form firmware has a vulnerability? I wish. Um, you know, I think that that's one of the things that's happening is try to, the industry is, and uh, trying to standardize how do we track um, the signatures of all these different firmware pieces so that we can even and consistently report the vulnerabilities so that we can make this a clear association. Um, there's no centralized place that I'm aware of. I think that that would be a great thing. Our next question is, why is users knowing how to update an issue? Can't the OS take care of that? So, you know, in Microsoft, you know, how, do, how does the user find out about it? Uh, how does the OS, how does the OS know that they should uh, get an update? Someone has to tell the OS that a, no a notification is available and that requires a centralized service. Uh, Microsoft has tried there with their Windows Update to allow delivery of uh, firmware updates, you know, through Windows Update. Um, and LVFS has tried, uh, tried this as well for Linux systems. But the uh, the truth is that it's it's uh, getting consistent notification and use of those channels is still pretty spotty. Okay, how can an end user find out the ingredients in the platform's firmware? Um, you can find out. So Alec, I think Alex showed it with IEFI yeah. Explorer, right? Yeah, so actually uh, it depends what kind of ingredients, but basically like dependencies and building some sort of visibility on uh, the code level, it can be done with EFI Explorer or if you want to scan your firmware for known vulnerabilities, Firmware Hunt actually very suitable for that. All right, and then our last question is, does EDK2 currently support SPDX or SWID SBOMs? Um, it doesn't, doesn't uh, have a way of packaging them right now, as far as I'm aware. I know there's been some initiatives to try and add SWID SBOMs to EDK2 um, from the LVFS folks. And so I hope that they, you know, we can get some standardization about how to do that. But so far, EDK2 does not does not do that. All right. So that was actually our last question for today. We'll be moving over to WebEx for a more live and interactive Q&A discussion. If you have any more questions, please join us over on WebEx. The information is displayed on your screen right now and in an announcement on Bright Talk. The presentation slides for this presentation will also be available on the UEFI Forum website and the webinar recording will be available on demand on the UEFI Forum YouTube channel and our Bright Talk channel. Thank you for attending Tackling Security Through the Supply Chain.